Yep. All right, that's good. Well, welcome everyone. This is, uh, I don't know how many out of the box workshops we've had, but quite a few. And uh, this is the October 19th edition, Flooding Response Lessons Learned and Future Work at UVM. And uh, I'm really thrilled to have Roy here um, and Nicole, who I didn't put down because I wasn't sure she was coming, but that's so that's great. And they're both co-chairs of the Ag State Ag Recovery Task Force, and they'll introduce themselves as well. And uh, Barry Simes, from as, who's a former fire chief and deputy chief of UVM Emergency Preparedness. Um, so kind of coming in from that angle, and it's great to have all of you here and we have an hour together a little less now and these workshops really um they're really providing this time and semi-structured space to um see if we can come up with some creative innovative ideas and, or solutions just really to address some critical issues and you know one of the things that we had hoped for early on and it's happened to a certain extent is that some of these project ideas could take off to become really um, innovative grant proposals uh, and maybe they would succeed, maybe they don't, but overall we're still building strong networks, we're meeting new people, and um, hopefully uh, improving our impact. And I want to thank our organizing team, Chris, who's here, um, myself, and Andrew May, who is not here today, and also with our media team, thanks, uh, Kathy Yando, Tina, and uh, Joanna Commons. So we're, you know, Cells of Society we're paired with, and as you see here, this is our schedule for the year, but we're, oct oh, that should say October 19th, it says the 12th, sorry about that. Uh, but we usually have two Cells of Society seminars, and then out of the box is really a chance to either pick up a theme that came up in the seminars or jump on something new, which is what we're doing now, right time, right place to look back at the flood and also just the crazy weather from the summer um, state of emergency and um, think about our role and how we did. So um, we can, this will be recorded, it is right now, and it will eventually show up on uh, the Social Society website. So with that, I'm gonna end uh, this show and our come back to full screen there we go all right and we have 13 people in the room so uh eric that was your hand up from before right that's not a new a new question okay so thanks again for everyone everyone for showing up here i'm going to be a loose facilitator sort of uh taking the lead here to start this off, but hopefully if things go well, I'll, I'll be able to step back uh, very soon. And um, what I would like to do is uh, go around real quick and let's have, um, uh, let's have Barry uh, and Nicole and Roy go last. Uh, just introduce yourself or where, where you're coming from, what department and, um, in un, a sentence or less, uh, where you where you were, or how after sort of after the weather state of emergency flooding, it, it, how you interacted with that? Um, just one one sentence, nothing, no detail. But if you if you did, how you did uh, in your job or whatnot. So I'll go first as a model, which is uh, yeah, Hans Sestrin, and I am uh, from UVM Extension, produce safety specialist, and during after the flood, I was part of a team that uh, worked with a lot of growers to, in part, to help them uh, sample soil for um, some of the heavy metals and also bacteriological contaminants. So uh, let's see, Maura, you want to go? I see you next. Sure. Hey, everyone. My name is Maura Folan. I'm the director of the Community Nutrition Education Program with Extension. Um, and I guess the biggest impact we had, we certainly had some basement flooding, but my husband's on the select board of our town and had to go out and take pictures of all the road damage and um, be away from us for quite some time to, to um, yeah, help get that back on track. Great, thanks, Mara. Eric? Eric von Wettberg, I'm a professor in plant and soil science. Apologies for the screen off like uh, Dan, I'm sneaking some lunch. You don't have to hide it. <laughs> We're all friendly here. 
Uh, Chris. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Callahan. I use he, him pronouns. I'm with uh, University of Vermont Extension. Uh, disciplinary focus is agricultural engineering based in Bennington. <clears throat> and I uh, was in, uh, involved in providing direct technical assistance to uh, produce growers around um, produce safety considerations resulting from uh, flooding and contact between produce and floodwaters and involved in the soil uh, testing uh, work uh, focused on um, human pathogens and um, other potential contaminants around the state. Chris, I'm going to ask you to choose the next person because my screen just keeps changing and I'm really tired of doing it. But Polly, I should have been keeping track. I know Polly is not interested. It's a test and, and Polly, you're going to have to pass it off too. OK, I will. Sure. So um, I'm Polly Erickson. I, I direct the Food Systems Research Center at, at UVM. Um, I'm new to Vermont. Um, so I was not at all directly affected by the flooding, except that um, my CSA couldn't come that week. Um, but I have a lot of experience working with clim on climate change and food and agriculture issues. And um, I um, have m mostly worked on um, in drought affected um, uh, settings where there are occasional floods. But I just I feel like we have got to be talking as much as we possibly can about what future climate shocks are going to do um, to our food system. So that's why I'm keen to engage with all of you. And I'm going to pick Vern to go next. All right. Hello, everybody. Vern Grubinger calling in from Southeast Vermont. I'm the vegetable and berry specialist with EVM Extension. And I think my main role in these kinds of events has been an aggregator and translator of information for growers um, communicating primarily through our listserv that is for the Vermont Vegetable and Berry Growers Association, but also a lot of personal contact. So trying to help people understand um, the technical resources like related to the produce contamination, but also the um, uh, funding opportunities. And, um, and then it just kind of morphs into social work, I guess, for lack of a better term, just somebody there that cares and someone to talk to and um, helping growers connect um, to support one another. And let's see, I see a lot of, uh, I guess I gotta go to the people here to see who's actually here. I will call on Dan. Thank you, Vern. Dan Lerner, Associate Director and Chair at UVM Extension. Um, we're normal, my family and I are normally away in July on family vacation, uh, but we didn't do that this year. And we were here when all the floods hit and I'm glad that we were. Um, my role in this with, with an extension has been helping to pull together all resources coming from all different locations and put them into two, two different internal places for extension personnel to see and draw upon. And then away from work uh, on a more personal level, uh, my wife and I assisting a friend whose family in Barry lost their home, completely destroyed. Um, I will pass it to Corinne. Hey there, this is Corinne in Berlin where usually I'm the um, administrative assistant. Usually I'm on the emergency management ends of disasters, but it was personal for me as I was flooded out and I've been continuing to help the other 40 families who were flooded out. And I must say that I also felt very supported by my colleagues here in the university in general. So thank you. Okay. Sarah, you might be the last before we get to the final three. Or from last. Sure. Hi, everybody. Sarah Kleinman. I'm the director of 4-H Family and Migrant Programs. Um, and like some of you, I think my role, well, my role in, in this particular flood was primarily helping my team, who was in the midst of running events, um, try to troubleshoot, especially with fairs and field days and, and other events out in different communities. Since we have people coming from all corners of the state, um, some people experienced challenges and others didn't. So disseminating information, um, trying to figure out what to do <laughs> and, and where to redeploy resources. And then also, of course, we had families that were affected. Um, and so like Vern, I think 
erring on that social work side. Um, and then we, we in the migrant space, of course, there were farm workers as well that were directly impacted and um, and some of the, the migrant immigrants uh, that are here in Vermont and helping them find other housing uh, and, and manage some of the, the issues. Um, also, personally, my right in Burlington, not much happened, but I did lose out on my CSA and uh, spent some time volunteering and, and supporting other people. Great, thank you, Sarah. So uh, with the, hey, the last three, yeah. Chris. Sorry, Laura, Laura Johnson has joined as well. Oh, OK, yeah, Laura, great. Um, quick introduction. You want me to just introduce myself? Uh, yep, and where you're working and then oh. what role you had, if any, in the in the recent uh, flooding uh, state of emergency stuff. OK, um, yeah, I work out of the Berlin office and uh, I think what I did was just take some soil samples for folks who um, were flooded. That was my role. I was not directly impacted. Sorry Great. to arrive late. <laughs> That's that's great. Thank you. OK, so we're jumping in and that we've already jumped in. We get a sense of who's in the room and some of the work that has been done. Um, and I did throw in the chat some of the questions we like prompts, general prompts we uh, thrown up and, uh, and thought about uh, before this meeting. Uh, but we're not I just putting those there as a reference and I love uh, I would love uh, Roy and Nicole and Barry to introduce themselves and uh, I, your special prompt is where you're coming from, but also if you can share just a little bit about um, in the work you're doing specifically around some of the disaster response or preparedness or flood response um, and especially the task force. I'm thinking on flood from the flood uh, task force that Nicole and uh, and Roy have been co-chairing. What are, what are some head scratchers? Like, what's come up in meetings so far? What's like one or two things that are really seem to be um, a conundrum that could that UVM might be able to um, uh, have a role in? That's I, and and if you don't like that, just you can throw it out. But uh, that's the that's the thought that occurred to me, especially if you've done some work on this already. If that's relevant, and if not, feel free to share what is relevant about where you're coming from. So anyway, uh, Roy, why don't we start with you? All right, yeah, so that's that's good. Um, so Roy Beckford is um, director of extension, uh, associate dean Carlos. Um, so and um, I'll introduce Nicole in a second, but I, my my family happened to be here when when the floods were happening in, in Vermont. And in particular, my youngest son, who was 12 years old, uh, couldn't understand why there was so much flooding with that little rain um, that he observed. And so it was a good lesson to explain topography and landscapes and so on, and to give him um, some sense that this was not Florida. And when a flood happened in Florida, it's downpour after downpour, um, and usually associated with a hurricane, but, um, and he got it. So, because we drove around a little bit, um, into the intervale, uh, toward the intervale, so we got some sense of what was happening. Um, I was, I was right after the um, the events started occurring. Um, I spoke with um, Anson Tibets, and one of the things that um, he wanted to 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 get from extension was um, a quick damage assessment of what was going on. One of the first persons I talked to was Vern, and Vern took the opportunity to send me um, the report from. 2011 for from that tropical storm Irene I think it was um, and it was interesting the similarities I actually took a moment to go back in time to look at the last major flood that happened in Vermont before that and the hundred year flood was some something around 1920s well there have been floods in between but the last major flood of, of that um, behemoth level was in, in the 1920s and in that flood um, the lieutenant, lieutenant gover, governor died. He drowned someplace. I mean, I just saw that interesting um, as a as a as a historical um, um, fact. Um, but right after that, we uh, once I started engaging with um, with my extension colleagues and uh, with the the agency of AG, um, it was decided that we they were going to put together a task force to kind of look at not just response but uh, recovery. Um, and Nicole Dubuque and myself were named as co-chairs. We've had several meetings and um, I'll 
Nicole is really at the forefront of this, um, putting putting helping pull the meetings together. Um, and so I'm going to introduce. I'm going to ask Nicole to introduce herself um, and kind of give some sense of what we're up to. Sure. So Nicole Dubuque, I'm the Chief Operations Officer for uh, the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets and uh, co-chair with Roy for the um, Agriculture Recovery Task Force. I am also the recovery liaison for our agency, which means that I meet regularly with the other recovery liaisons from the other state agencies, um, as well as the Chief Recovery Officer, which is uh, Doug Farnham. So I uh, I can talk a little bit about the agency uh, or the, excuse me, the agriculture task force first and how that plays into my other role, because um, I think that might be helpful. So like Roy said, we've had a few meetings at this point. We have representation from um, UVM Extension, multiple state agencies, and, and many uh, partners in the agricultural sector, including um, also uh, federal representatives from USDA, uh, both rural development and also um, FSA. So most recently, we've been working to name um, kind of our top priorities. We've heard from farmers. We've been hearing from um, different agencies about what they're experiencing with what needs are, what gaps are. And so um, we're breaking the Ag Recovery Task Force down into subgroups right now. And those three subgroups are regulatory recovery, farmer empowerment, and government systems um, so that people can really kind of get in the weeds and dig deeper into what are the gaps and what are the priorities for recovery. So we will be uh, having the subgroups come back together at our next full task force meeting on November 15th to lay those out. Ultimately, uh, the goal of the task force is to identify those priorities and goals, both short-term and long-term, and then also um, where the gaps are so that we can have um, a report out at the end. And I will, as the recovery liaison for the state, report that up to the bigger statewide uh, task force. And then it'll also end up being a, a public report um, that you know Roy will continue to work with me on. Um, so that's where we're at with the Ag Recovery Task Force. Um, me personally with the flood, I've been working on this. I've also been processing applica applications for BGAP, which is the uh, Business Emergency Gap Assistance Program, excuse the acronym. Um, so that uh, has been really helpful for many uh, farmers. I think we are almost done processing applications, just collecting um, incomplete documents at this point to get payments out the door. Um, yeah, and then we're working on policy stuff. And then as far as where I was for the flood, um, I was actually in Montpelier that day and I barely made it through the interstate before it closed. So that was nice. Um, but I I live up in Grand Isle County and we did not have much of an impact um, here on our personal property, thankfully. All right, so 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 Hans, before we, we get we get to Barry, um, I, I know I, I worked quite a bit with um, Michael Sherling as things were being organized across the state. Um, and uh, I know there is close um, connection or connectivity between Barry's office and Michael's office. Um, so um, he can actually speak to that a little bit more uh, and talk about some of the things that that um, perhaps um, he was involved with or he was engaged with, with, with Mike's office. So Barry, over to you. Great, thanks, Roy, and and welcome everybody, and thanks for the opportunity to join you. Uh, my name is Barry Simes. I am the F University Fire Marshal and Deputy Emergency Manager for the University of Vermont. Uh, a little bit about my history. Uh, so I spent a, a, a career in the fire service, uh, retired from the City of Burlington Fire Department uh, after 21 and a half years, and and came here to UVM uh, as the fire marshal. I retired out as the city fire marshal and a battalion chief. Uh, so my background comes uh, from more of the uh, fire service response and mainly the uh, fire prevention and code compliance aspect of it. So every uh, any given day, I could be interpreting uh, the fire and life safety codes for any of a number of constituents on campus, uh, working with construction projects and such, um, conducting assessments, supporting uh, larger special events on campus. Um, 
and it wasn't until uh, April of this year, my position was previously housed in uh, the department's, the former Department of Risk Management and Safety, which became the Department of Environmental Health and Safety. Uh, so in April of this year, my position was strategically moved into the Department of Emergency Management, which caused it to move from a an office of one to a department of two. Uh, so John Marcus, uh, the previous uh, fire marshal for the university, is the emergency manager. Um, he was he's otherwise unavailable today. He's actually on vacation and way out of state. Uh, which uh, is very deserved. So I'm standing in for John. Um, he, whereas I'm becoming more oriented to the traditional aspects of emergency management, um, he, John, this is the world that John works in uh, every day. So he's very, we are, as a department, are very well connected with the Department of, uh, uh, of Emergency Management with the state, uh, VEM as it's known. Uh, my primary interface with the state would be the Department of, excuse me, the Division of Fire Safety, which is housed within the Department of Public Safety. Um, so that's a little bit about how we work. So my caveat is today, I'm still learning a lot of the, uh, the, the nuances of traditional emergency management work uh, and expanding what, what it is that I do and how I approach uh, crisis situations. Uh, but my primary focus is still in the um, in the code compliance world. So I'll do the best I can. And if there's any uh, questions that I can't answer, I'd be happy to take that back to John and we can get some clarity on that and circle back to Roy and Hans. Um, so our we the Department of Emergency Management is housed in the uh, in the D Division of Safety and Compliance at the university, uh, which is fairly new over about a year ago, okay, uh, when Mike Sherling, as the Chief Safety and Compliance Officer, came to the university, uh, formerly uh, was the Commissioner of Public Safety for the state of Vermont. Uh, and before that, in my time as with the fire department, he was the police chief in, in the city of Burlington. Um, so where uh, John Marcus and I, the week of the flood, we actually ended up uh, supporting uh, the Division of Fire Safety with uh, rapid building assessments in the in and around the Barry Montpelier area. Uh, so we spent uh, a full day on that Thursday in Barry, Berlin, and Montpelier <clears throat> with this working with state inspectors to uh, to do rapid assessments. And then John went out uh, again on Friday. Um, we and as a division, uh, Mike Sherling spent a lot of time in the state em state's emergency operations center up at the Berlin Airport. Uh, and his primary function um, was coordination of the volunteer resources from UVM, uh, which was a considerable considerable effort and undertaking. Uh, and and UVM uh, faculty, staff, and students played a huge role in helping to our communities to recover uh, through their service. So that's a little bit about uh, professionally what my involvement was. It wasn't very much, uh, but we were of course monitoring the situation. Uh, and and standing ready to assist in any way that we we could, uh, based on our our professional backgrounds. So, great, thanks a lot, Barry. Yeah, we have thirty five minutes, and the goal would be to get you know as as much as many good ideas, good discussion, um, and we do have the opportunity if we want to break into um, some subgroups for a bit to dig into more specific issues. Um, what I would like to do uh, be before we make that decision actually is is take a pause here and open up the floor. So, you know, it's it's what 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 could have or what went well in July? What could we have done better? And how could UVM be better prepared for the next next time this happens? And it's not actually whatever this is, right? We don't know if it's gonna be a flood. It's some, uh, we don't know when it's happening, probably not in the next 25 minutes, uh, but I guess that's possible. Uh, and what lessons could we take with us to help improve what we're gonna do in the future, whether it be response or, um, you know, there's really these two buckets of, you know, are there things we would do internally to prepare ourselves to, to respond or are there things that we should really do that are out in the community? This thing, you know, what Nicole mentioned about farmer empowerment, for example, how the, the clients that we work with. So there's, 
ways of thinking about this, but um, I would love to just pause for a minute and have anyone raise their hand and pipe up. What if, you know, what seems to be, um, if, uh, let's let's do more forward looking. You can wrap in maybe some of the stuff that happened, but what's this lesson learned? Um, wh what would you say should rise to the top for work we could do um, now or in the in the near future to help do a better job next time? So Hans, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a 15 second or a little yep. bit more than that um, preamble here. Um, I went to work in the British Virgin Islands in 1993, and while I understood very very much understood um, the role of extension um, and 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 how information systems work, I got a lesson from an old farmer who was about 90 90 years old at the time, and he told me he basically explained to me in one sentence the value of information. He, he told me that before the 1930s in the Virgin Islands, he said when a hurricane came through, they only they, they, most of them were unnamed and they just called them storms. And he said they would wipe out every everything they had and they were dependent on themselves for food. I mean, it was ma mainly subsistence agriculture. And he said the minute they started naming storms and he started hearing that a hurricane was heading their way on the radio through news and so on, he said it changed everything because now they could prepare for it. Um, there were warning systems, they could save things unripe or, you know, whatever. But he said it meant a massive difference between going hungry in the days afterwards or having some food for the next few weeks. That was a lesson to me um, that I'd never understood mm -hmm. um, prior, prior to that in terms of how Im important information is. Mm -hmm. Timing. Yeah. Um, uh, thanks, Roy. Vern, I'm wondering if you might be able to because you jumped right into this and wrote some stuff um, earlier on and have done some of the Irene work if you might be able to just reflect on you know what rises to the top for you in agriculture which is I guess the field you're working in but uh, that would be a helpful place to start I think given what you've sure done. well just following on Roy's point you know when we know something's coming so we had the freeze in May we knew that was coming there was opportunity you know, we knew produce was going to be affected. Orchards and blueberries and strawberries. So, you know, there's a chance to go out and collect information and provide it ahead and tell people the methods of protecting crops and the flooding is more complicated. <laughs> and also, um, I think we were surprised this time more than we were certainly with the frost. But we have talked about this, a flow chart being developed of what are all the things a farmer needs to do? Because when the thing happens, that was the big message I got from farmers is they're overwhelmed. Um, and some of it with good intention. I mean, one farmer said, if I get one more email about my mental health, I'm going to lose my mental health. It's like, that's not what I'm focusing on. I'm just trying to make payroll. And, you know, I need money. I need a check. Where do I? So, so I just put that populated that uh, in the chat. You know, it was a quick brainstorm right after. And I guess I'm a little... Well, the time is right. We've been through two of these now. It's, it's sort of the same. A lot of those lessons we learned after Irene and didn't really articulate them and act on them. And so there's some clear themes emerge, like the need for short-term funding and managing the longer-term funding. So, you know, crop insurance payments don't happen fast. None of the federal money happens fast. The state, mar state money may be a little faster. It's still slow. So go fund me and no fun you know those were things that people got right away um but again the fact you know and i served on the so, so one thing was interesting the vermont community foundation all the folks were new there i mean when i talked to them they didn't even know that they had stood up a farm disaster fund after irene <laughs> so once they were reminded of that they stood it up so you know, just thinking about all the applications. And then I just was on the NRCS State Tech Committee call. They gave out $4 million. The Vermont Community Fund gave out 1.5. BGAP, I think, was a million. I don't know what NOFA did. I don't know what folks are going to get for NAP or crop insurance. Um, GoFundMe. So just thinking about four of those at least could have some kind of uniform application instead of the same thing over and over. Um, and then the burden should be looked at. The difference between the VCF application and the BGAP was kind of profound, even though the same information was needed and money was going to the same people. Um, and then just, yes, yeah, stewarding the onslaught of emails that growers get all intended to be helpful, like a single better coordination. So that's one thing for sure. Um, and then 
you know, we've now done contamination sampling twice after floods, largely not finding anything. There's a whole deeper dig there of can we move FDA's needle about <laughs> making farmers throw all this stuff away, especially things that get peeled and cooked and maybe not, but it's, the you know, additional experiments and research to figure out if that case has legs or not, I think would be important. The, and then you have the feed and the mycotoxin. And my perception is it was very different response this time than after Irene. It seemed, maybe I got it wrong, but it seemed a lot stricter after Irene. And partly there's a feed crisis and animals are going to starve without feed. And um, so maybe that was part of it. Um, the other thing, I, would, you know, I said this yesterday on the uh, NRCS call, I hope we can take that kind of report we had from Irene and amp it up to actually draw some robust conclusions, more data. The, those applications, the information in the VCF application is really valuable if it could be anonymized and coded and just what, so one thing, just damages I never anticipated. People had no damage, but lost all their markets because they were in Montpelier. <laughs> there were restaurants and stores. And so they were trying to navigate their eligibility. Um, the whole thing where people had their feed supply was purchased feed. They didn't have damage on their farm, but they couldn't buy feed from the regular suppliers. And then replacement costs not being at the costs that were, you know, standard and documented for animal feed. So I'm rambling a little bit here, but there's I just feel like I learned a lot the second time through on top of what we learned after Irene. And then when we had several at once, so like the fact the VCF loan did not include May. Seems like the the people that were damaged from frost were really just hung out to dry. They and the there was a local meeting down here of orchardists. Those folks actually have insurance. It's not just NAP. They have and they're getting ten cents on the dollar. I mean, they're so we just have a whole bunch of people already on the edge financially that just really get hit hard by these things. And there's not a mechanism. So if we care about sustaining agriculture, I think to me this is like job one to find out how. How can we financially support people, um, especially when we're asking them to throw away their products for the greater public good? Um, and the last thing I'll just say, I've talked to Chris about this a little, you know, the tiering of this. So those applications were super interesting. You have people lost a half a million dollars and they're applying to get a $10,000 check. And then you have people and, and they they typically, you know, some of them are producing a million dollars worth of food a year. And then you have people who have lost $20,000 it's a very significant portion of their total income <laughs> and they're getting a $10,000 check. So I just, I don't know the right algorithm for this, but there's there's no, we have not been working on the proportionality of support <laughs> for the different kinds of enterprises. And I don't know, you know, I don't know the answer that both those businesses are at risk, but what worries me is, especially in the vegetable world, right? A small number of significant producers that produce a lot of food are just expected to manage this enormous loss and stay in business. And I'm not sure how good of a long-term plan that is. Polly has her hand raised. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so I wanted to get a sense, I mean, because <laughs> we always hear that we weren't we weren't prepared and we weren't we weren't ex we weren't expecting it. But I mean is that just because it You've had one in 1920 and you had it in 2011 and then and then and then it's happened now because that lack of preparedness burn is what leads to all the problems of coordination and the inadequate financial resources because nobody nobody was planning for this to happen on a recurrent on a recurrent basis um but so i mean why were we so surprised when it had been raining and raining um and uh so, so I mean that's I guess I guess one one question and then back to Roy's point I mean people have been talking about you know, improved climate forecasts and improved climate information um, as resources for helping people better prepare for disasters. But again, if there's this mentality that it's a, a one-off and it's not really going to happen. So, um, and I would argue that we need to think of, um, like our farming needs to become much more climate resilient, which means that the policy support for it um, needs to be there. And so, um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not critiquing, I think all of the individual things Vern has talked about, but this to me demands like a like a higher level just kind of mindset change um, 
so I don't know. I don't know where, I don't know where, I mean, yeah. Well, just that's... real quick, some nuance on this. So partly it is mm -hmm. the micro locality of, like it didn't flood in the same place as it did after Irene. Right. Some places, yes, but not everywhere. And the timing, Irene was late August. It was a great mm -hmm. growing season. People had made a lot of money and they lost the end of the season. This was July. All the yeah. expenses were out and almost no income in. Yeah. Completely different situation. So you can be, I think a lot of the growers in floodplains know they're going to flood sometimes, but yeah. there hadn't been planning for, hmm, how's it going to work under this kind of situation? Mm -hmm. um, and not knowing where the water is going to go exactly mm -hmm. is part of it. But I mean, I do hear you. You would think <laughs> that there would have been a, more preparation. But I, I guess this speaks to the second question, Hans. Um, about UVM's role in all of this. How much, what's her, what was her role, what's been her role post Irene in looking at um, helping with resilient infrastructure and technology or advocating for those things? Um, and, and capacity building as well. Those are, by the way, these are some of the things I've been writing down in my interactions at the um, task force. Um, so I have more coherent notes on this, but kind of want to see what 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 was the takeaway from from Irene in terms of advocacy around resilient infrastructure and I know that has to do with some amount of engineering as well technology um to to mitigate against the, the, the kind of lo the losses we saw is there an answer to that I mean I, <laughs> I actually don't uh, I don't have a particular answer to I have post Irene. Uh, Burn, do you or anyone? I'm making a guess that our agriculture engineer was hired well after after Irene. Um, I get the sense that Chris started after 2011. Um, so that that I'm sure um, um, was an asset that we never, a resource we never had before. Too bad we can't blame him. You, you can. That's fine. Um, I, I was hired in 2012, but uh, I'll, I'll make. I, I think drawing a connection between something UVM extension did post Irene in response to Irene might be might be difficult. But um, some observations. I I work with farms that have intentionally moved uphill um, and given up uh, preferred soils for the resilience of being uphill. And and working on grade when they they wouldn't previously. So that's one thing. So that 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 introduces some challenges. But at you know with the benefit of uh, a, maybe a little bit more um, resilience. Um, certainly, I think loads of soil health work and uh, um, it should should not be um, missed in this conversation uh, as probably preventing. What could have been a lot worse. Um, I'll leave that to Vern um, to, to tell me I'm wrong or or not. Um, I, I I think the other thing I want to go back to the first question while I'm while I'm unmuted. What went well? <clears throat> I saw a tremendous amount of care in UVM uh, within UVM uh, for each other, but also for our communities. And it was nice to see that supported organizationally. Um, so I feel like that was a very strong cultural um, benefit or um, a performance uh, on the part of UVM. Um, I, I have other thoughts on what we can do better, but I don't want to take up all the time. Vern, any thoughts on, on that stuff? Well, I just put in the chat, the collaboration was really quite good across agencies. Um, and that's really important. And we were kind of coordinating on the fly a little bit. So I think if we have sort of a foundation of, doesn't have to be totally dialed in, but, um, and one particular frustration for growers was that loss reporting of the FSA, one's opaque, they can't share it with anyone. It's not online, it's telephone calls and then state then collected afterwards and NOFA collected and I had an inform. So we're at least four asked probably more about losses. Um, so that's something we could certainly uh, work on. So there's some you know low hanging fruit here to be more caring of the farmer's time. Um, 
So should we should we let me let me bring Barry in because I want to ask whether UVM should be conducting more risk, risk assessments to identify vulnerabilities where our stakeholders are. That's a really good question. Um, and don't want to promise anything that we don't have the resources to deliver as a university, but I think what this might come down to is in thinking in terms of what are the what are the priorities of of traditional emergency management in any community? Well, emergency management helps us is a process by which to help us prepare for, respond to, mitigate against, and recover from all sorts of all types of of emergencies and and disasters really it's an all hazards approach and when we were when hans and and roy and i were were talking earlier this week um and brainstorming a little bit one of the one of the uh, the ideas that i had as a resource is vermont emergency management and you know vermont's a very large very large uh, fairly large state right not as big as some others but um comprised of a significant number of of small communities and and it occurred to me that probably the best resource that that we have available to us and and the and the the producers that reside in and and work in in all of these communities are the local uh the local emergency management directors and as a point of contact and and resource right in many in most cases uh you know and I grew up in Lamoille County, right, in, in the town of Johnson, relatives in the town of Waterville, very small communities where some of these positions were pure volunteer positions. Uh, but it was a it was a point of connection back to emergency management and the resources that they can provide. And specifically in the sense of planning, right? So this this topic comes down to, for me, I mean, we have to respond to emergencies. That's when the emergency is occurring. But there's a tremendous amount of preparedness and, and uh, uh, work that can be done, just communication, public information, uh, communicating with with your, your constituents, and also some mitigation work, right? So Vermont Emergency Management, and I'll drop a link in the chat to, to VEM's website, and there's a tremendous amount of material there that may find useful, uh, may not, but I understand from the, the Emergency Preparedness Conference a few weeks ago that John and I attended that they are... VEM is, is stood up a recovery and mitigation section, uh, and they have a tremendous amount of resources uh, and positions in, in that area uh, for mitigation work. But uh, in, in the areas that, that John and I work primarily in that are UVM centric, uh, you know, around the area of the ideas of um, emergency planning, uh, policy and planning, um, the policy is the document that that tells us what we are going to do and what the lines of authorities are. And the emergency operations plan for the university is the plan that tells us in a, in a framework, what, what is it that we are going to do in an emergency? Um, and we're also looking at uh, one of the projects that John will be working on eventually is business continuity. Okay, so to me, and in my previous work with in the city of Burlington, having a plan and then uh, making sure the plan is is revised and current um, and and is uh, and is communicated and is exercised. Uh, and then if the plan is enacted uh, following a major event that it that there's an after action review that takes place and you take lessons learned and you apply it to that plan, to me that's that's the starting point. And any any of us like let's take a, a, let's take draw a parallel to our own our own homes, right? You know, coming from the fire service and last week being fire prevention week, we, we have always encouraged people to have and practice a home fire escape plan. That way, when you know, when, when the event actually happens, that you, you've practiced the plan, you have a good established plan, and then that helps, that helps with your personal response. And I think to me, the same, the same, uh, the same thought process could very, very easily be applied to uh, the constituents that you're referring to. So for me, it starts with planning and planning and preparedness and then mitigation through the resources that each community has, whether it's through the town clerk's office, through the select board, every, every town has an emergency management director and really your constituents are stakeholders within every community. 
and they're a major part of that community. Right. So that's that's where my thought process is going. Okay. Barry, I'd like to just add on to that, and then also Sarah has a uh, had a good uh, comment in the chat, and I think S SB too, like a while back. So feel free to any of you to pipe up too, and um, just follow up on what you wrote. Um, yeah, Barry. So after our last conversation, I that was one of the brainstorms I had, which is like I, we work with farms and, you know, I have these uh, the farmers that write plans for produce safety. They're doing flood a little bit on flood response if you know, if they were going to have a flood. But, you know, it, it seems like resourcefulness, resilience is really about thinking about your all these situations. Who are your resources? Who what's the local network? Um, who can you draw on? Because in an emergency, it's not like, you know, some this sort of top down, you know, things come out of the sky and pick you up and bring you away. Right. You're 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 actually really needing to deal in the moment. And that preparedness is really important. And it seems like there are templates out there. We don't need to reinvent the wheel in a way. We just need coordination and, and put that out there uh, somehow. And um, I think that that just hit me in, in at least, you know, for the folks that I work with. Um, one other thing about resilience, too, I want to say for food systems is it's not just like the flood hit. It was an awful timing, but then it just rained and rained and it had worst season ever. So these were so many farms that couldn't were not flooded, but they couldn't get in the fields with their tractors for a long time. So this slow moving disaster and everyone was down at least 40 percent, 50 percent loss. You know, I've heard over and over again. Uh, one farmer lost uh, probably 90 percent of their crop they ended up getting on the phone because they're a big supplier to shaws and through whatever you have to be good on the phone found some growers in plains in new york and got all this stuff from plains growers to cover what they were doing and supply shaws so for everything that they asked for and and um so he turned into a middleman this is like pivoting now that's resilience right there and it's about networking but it's in the region and and that was a kind of interesting thing uh, one conversation that stuck out anyway i'll stop there uh, sarah and any anyone else chris chris and then sarah or, or yeah. sarah now. go ahead sarah please sorry oh no you well you had your hand up first um I was just going to add on some my comments. Um, I do recall during Irene, but I also recognize that Irene was it was many years ago, and systems have changed considerably since then. Um, the web, broadband, like there's so many more ways to get communication out with social media. So, to me, that's like all. It's hard to compare the two situations. But again, my my focus is more internal with an extension. I think something that could help if we when we're confronted with something like this in the future is that we we have our own emergency plan that involves like an all hands on deck, you know, weekly meeting um, so that we are coordinated. We know what people are doing. Um, those of us who aren't involved in this direct dissemination and working with farms can support our colleagues if they need it. That was something that we did during Irene um, is that we were out going door to door with forms and, 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 and maybe that was led by um, the agency, I, I honestly can't remember, but it does. Anyway, it really, to me, felt like um, everybody with an extension was doing their great work and they were out and and but we weren't coordinated um, and I don't recall having a meeting among everybody to learn who was doing what. Uh, and I think that that's something that could be helpful for us in the future. And Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks, Roy. I think Sarah makes a good point, and Chris had some more on the similar track over in the chat. Um, we, and these were, I think, I guess you say, Sarah, these are sort of internally directed comments. Um, you're correct. The relevant result there, team did not want to convene. I, I was a little surprised as well. I, that was one of my first thoughts, but they didn't want it. Um, regardless, um, you make a very interesting point about uh, main, developing and maintaining a steady state of preparedness so that when this or something else happens, we we simply open the box that we've got and, and we run the plays. Um, I'm thinking back, you know, we, we had a little bit of capacity develop, devoted to Eden many years ago through a single faculty member who had a partial appointment to it. But uh, and we had somebody working in farm safety and both of those things are no longer present. Um, but you make an interesting point about how we might think about 
trying to recapture some of that energy um, and, you know, and then nurse it along. I, 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 I wonder, Barry, I, I don't know if this is in your basket or not. I wonder if the university might have some resources they could devote to help us to do that, uh, to at least stand, stand it up. Uh, and then we would take it from there in terms of uh, keeping things maintained and keeping things fresh. I think that's a very good question. So if you can just follow up, uh, send a note to uh, John Marcus and myself with that question. Uh, that's that's going to have to be that to me would fall. That would be a question best addressed at John's level uh, as a director's position, because I think there's something there. Right. And, um, you know, any way we can get we can help we can help not only extension and extension statewide, but extension uh, the constituents of extension uh, to to disseminate some information. And 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 how do we um, how do we in, introduce preparedness and planning to maybe, uh, you know, an audience that doesn't that hasn't considered it right? Because the, the truth of the matter, this is growing up in the state in a rural part of the state is there's a certain period of time where you're on your own in an emergency, right? And uh, it's it's incumbent upon all of us to to be ready for that. And then there are certain steps to take before. And this is what from my side of of public safety preparedness training is we want to provide the audience with the steps that they can take to ensure their own, in my case, safety, but also preparedness in those. What, what are those steps that you can take before help gets to you? Uh, and it could even, you know, extend to to a conversation of, OK, we're in the middle of winter and a significant power outage happens. Right. So once once the framework is established and, and individuals have that framework, then they can they can populate that with, you know, any consideration that that meets the needs of of their individual business or situation i think it's yeah send a note to send a note to john and i and we can talk about it when he gets back that's yeah, great good idea. Some really really good stuff coming out of this chris you had something and eric i think uh then is number two i'll, I'll be quick eric uh i know i've already spoken a bunch um i i i don't actually remember a call for a result area teams meeting and that to me suggests that i was maybe in a fog and i think that's an important thing to keep in mind um we may need to be cross-trained to support each other that way um you know so when a particular event is hitting one group uh maybe disproportionately uh maybe another uh, part of the organization can backfill in a way that's that's helpful in facilitating those conversations mm -hmm. And even planning within groups, of, you know, this thought of, you know, for for the ag team, you know, team dealing with farms, team dealing, you know, 4-H, et cetera. Um, Eric, you were next. Yeah, and then so, Grin. I'm, uh, I'm not extension, so I wouldn't be on any of the, these teams. We do a fair amount of on-farm work, particularly with Vermont Land Trust and some of their uh, farmer, farmers that graze that they work with. I'm looking at Vern's fact sheet for veg and berry growers for preparedness, and we need something similar for long-term preparedness for uh, pasture growers. I think, you know, to Vern's earlier point that cover crops helped on the landscape, I think well-managed pastures help too. They're a, a soil sponge. They, they hold more water and it would be worse with that if they were in a different land use type um all of the grazers i've talked with say i'm great in a drought i know how to stock for this i know how to prepare i have no idea what to do this year and people who regularly have fields that look beautiful uh they look horrible this year and you know they're not suffering the way that a a veg producer is they don't lose everything one time of year the same way uh, so the scale of losses and the scale of resilience are, are different, but um, we can definitely do more to be more prepared or better prepare them. And Eric, would you see that as a uh, within the group that you work with this group of, of uh, great, you know, producer animal um, producers, whatever grazers? Yeah. Thank you. So the 
point what Barry was saying as far as um, potential long-term outage power outages, the Calis area this year just before Christmas and during Christmas experienced not only widespread power outage, but phone outage. And they discovered that it was very difficult to reach the residents to let them know where they could go, um, where there was a generator to recharge phones and so forth. And they also discovered that radio stations tended to point people to lists online as far as where you could find help instead of just announcing it on the radio so those who at least had batteries in a radio could get information. And so that's just something to keep in mind as far as, you know, if you're calling something in or sending something into a radio station, asking them to announce out the specifics and making these plans in advance so people know where to go, who to contact if they have really limited means to do so, because that happens. Mm. Great. Well, we're, you know, I'm looking at time here. We're almost out of time and I really want to make sure to call. You also have an opportunity to, since you're going back to your, the Montpelier or wherever you are, <laughs> um, I'm, I know we can get in touch with you, but uh, from this, are there things that are kind of rising to the top for you um, or that you would bring back or that you would suggest? Yeah, that's something that uh, UVM would be, it would be great if, if uh, UVM could take this kind of thing on or that kind of, something like this. So I feel like everything I've heard, uh, some things I heard actually were really like enlightening light bulb. Um, Vern, some of the things that, that you were talking about um, really were just like, oh, that makes so much sense. Um, but I, I don't have something off the top of my head to say, like, I'm going to bring this uh, back necessarily. I think a lot of this is just in line with what um, I have been hearing and I, you know, would obviously encourage all of you, I'm sure you send things to Roy, but just as things come up for you, um, and I know that this meeting's recorded, so I'll probably go back and, and watch some of that um, just to make sure I, I caught some of the points. But yeah, I would just encourage you to reach out and let me know as things come um, up for you. I know one thing uh, that came up for me recently, I keep getting phone calls about it from different um, farmers, and I hadn't even thought about it until now, which seems ridiculous. But I, I think somebody said, you know, we get kind of in a fog of like, we're so hyper focused on certain things, um, was farmers who do cut flower farms, farmers who garlic, things like that, where it's like they don't even know until next spring, like how bad it is for them. So it, they're having struggles even like applying for programs because they don't know what to write in the narrative. Like, I don't I don't know where I'm at yet. Um, so things like that have been on my radar this week with phone calls. But yeah, I really appreciate you all uh, letting me sit in and listen. Thanks so much for for coming, Nicole. And we are at time right now. Um, I do also have the sense that this uh, could go a lot longer we could do more we could circle back um, on it with another session in the winter um, if need be and I, and you know I'm, I definitely am hearing loud and clear this coordination clear information management um, and then not reinventing the wheel uh, helping folks in in the field prepare in whatever way they need to and potentially coming together as teams uh, within the university to make plans within our either departments or areas um, and yeah, Vern, a lot of the stuff that you and Chris wrote uh, for me it really hits home. I mean, thinking thinking about that. So um, yeah, there's a lot here. Roy, do you have any last words um, or or Barry before we say goodbye for today? Um, let me defer to Barry. Um... Thanks, Roy. No, it was a great opportunity. Thank you very much. And um, and when again, again, when John gets back, I think there's some opportunities here. So at least we can. If we can even help, uh, you know, uh, orient you extension and apply, you know, a traditional framework for planning, and and I think that would be a, a tremendous outcome. It's something that you can share far and wide, and it's really it's the the traditional frameworks do apply no matter which um, w what type of emergency we're planning for. So, and Hans, if I, if I if I have to add anything, um, there are a few things that I'm taking away from this. There, there's a need for greater coordination within UVM and at UVM within extension as well. Um, also, 
Uh, certainly the capacity building and knowledge sharing that we're good at, we should we should do some more of that. Um, resilient infrastructure and technology, because many of the farmers are asking for that, including the cut flower farmers and garlic farmers. And then just the general disaster preparedness and response um, from uh, agencies like Eden, we, we should get supported for that. And then a risk assessment as necessary to, to um, assist our uh, collaborators and stakeholders. OK, well, that's thank you for that great summary there, Roy. And Chris, I think that's a great idea. Epic uh, scenario exercise. And uh, thank you all for showing up. And uh, we'll circle back uh, potentially in the winter with a follow up session. And maybe it's where we have to have some more you know, concrete proposals to um, toss around. OK, bye, Thank everyone. You. Thanks. Yeah.